Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. This is This Year in Watches. True, we're not quite done with the year, but I'm going to be back with Josh Thanos for the Friday prior to New Year, and we're going to do that one right up and straight up live. So I'm joining you today with Tim's Top 10 of the year 2017. Of course, I'm coming to you from Watchbox Studios, and we are customarily going to share a watch at the beginning of the episode, so... We'll start with the sound off and then finish up with a wrist shot. I'm wearing my Grand Memovox Platinum Perpetual Calendar, one of 250 made. It's got a lovely bronze gong inside that you just heard. This is one of my favorite pieces, and I can't think of a better watch to wear towards the end of the year when all of those registers turn over. Okay, so since I am back in New York with my family wrapping up the holiday season as you watch this, let's flow with my top 10 of the moment. But first, remember that you can follow me throughout this weekend away at Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. I like to post fun stuff. I like to post big pictures of watches, cars, and I'm video intensive on Instagram too, so I get all of the details and including the watches that have a special sound or style to them. All right, so in no particular order, Tim's Top 10 2017, I'm going to start with the one that had the biggest impact on me personally, and that's Watchbox. You kind of saw the progression. One day, Miami went away. Suddenly, we're back, and we're in Philadelphia. And then all of a sudden, a real studio shows up and a professional crew. What's with that? Well, in November, you finally saw our new website and the turnover of a new leaf to Watchbox. Same friendly folks, same fun process, but on a website that finally doesn't look like it hails from the GeoCities era. Fun, fast, and frequently updated. Check out the Watchbox.com, my new home on the web, along with Watchbox Studios and Watchbox Reviews on YouTube. All right. So... I have to say from the personal high to the collective congratulations, the best of the watch industry in 2017 was encapsulated in the GPHG 2017. Now this is the watchmaking equivalent of the Oscars, the Academy Awards, uh, voted upon by luminaries of the industry, enthusiasts, journalists, and there were a couple that stood out. Every year there are several categories, but you have to give a salute to Chopard, which is on a winning streak, having effectively taken the Aguidor, the Grand Prize, two years in a row. This year, with the Chopard LUC Full Strike. Now, it's not their first chiming watch. That was actually the Strike 1 in 2006, but it is their most innovative and one of the most memorable of the year. First, you're getting a sapphire welded gong. I should mention this watch incorporated three patents with, within its rose gold 42.5 millimeter case. A special blocking mechanism so you couldn't accidentally set the watch while it's chiming. A separate power reserve like a grand sonnery to run the repeater. A silent governor. And, this was an interesting one, a sapphire fire gong welded to the chimes. Now that's pretty innovative. In fact, it was innovative even when JLC did the same thing 15 years ago, but that's just me being mean. Otherwise, well-deserved Chopard, and after Chronometry Fernand Bershoud won with the 1.1, the FB 1.1 last year, that is the ultra haute brand under Chopard's leadership. This is two years in a row for the folks from Fleurier. Congratulations. Okay, more accessibly, the Bulgari Octo Finissimo won the men's watch category, and that's a pretty big deal considering most watches launched every year in the luxury space are men's watches. Now, this is a watch that's best looked at as the culmination of a journey. In 2000, Bulgari bought Gerald Genta and Daniel Roth, the manufacturer in Le Sentier. Towards the middle of the decade, they added Cadran de Zine a dial factory, and Prestige Door, which made bracelets, clasps, and cases. But it still felt like an assembly of impressive parts rather than an integrated manufacturer with a strong identity. Well, in 2014, they launched the ultra-thin tourbillon. And then in 2016, they followed up with the minute repeater, both record setters at the time. Then this year, with the re then record setting, world's thinnest automatic watch with the Octo Finissimo automatic, here's what sets this one apart. Not only the third in the trillion, but the first one that you can buy for real-world money. Like, I could have had a sport bike, or I could have had this watch. I could have had a Daytona, or I could have had the world's thinnest automatic. Not all are going to make that choice in Bulgari's favor, but the fact that they now have a true hand-finished, in-house, fully integrated manufacturer product in the Haute de Gamme and a GPHG Laureate, that's impressive. This is Bulgari arriving. Now, the third and final watch I'm shouting out from the GPHG was probably my favorite watch of the year. This could have easily been the Aguidor, the grand prize winner by itself, but it's the Parmigiani Fleurier 
Rotonda Cronor Anniversaire, a chronograph and a knockout in the chronograph category that was absolutely stacked this year. It had to overcome the Singer Track 1 by Agenor. It had to overcome the Zenith Defi El Primero 21, the Tag Heuer Octavia Caliber 02 Revival, and the Mont Blanc 1858 Tachymeter Chronograph in bronze built by Minerva. So this was the, the Conqueror. Four versions, 25 pieces of each. It was an anniversary watch that was actually announced last year to mark 20 years of the Parmigiani Fleurier manufacture. Consider this dial one of the few enamel blues you will ever see. The other standout enamel blue of the year was the Patek Philippe 5539 minute repeater. So that's the kind of company we're talking. A rose gold caliber 361 Rattrapont movement with an El Primero style 10 beat per second rate. There were so many hand finished interior angles on this rose gold caliber that Ariel Adams and I actually agreed on something. This was a drool worthy watch and it could have been the outright champion as it is. It's a worthy source of uh, adulation and a prize for your 135,000 US dollars well spent. That said, from fabulous debuts and recognitions to recognition of a fabulous cause. Only Watch 2017 was the seventh edition of the every other year benefit charity auction that is conducted by Christie's on behalf of muscular dystrophy benefits. So this is kind of the opposite of the high-end auction scene at large. The more people bid, the better you actually feel. And you also see some of the best voyeuristic fun in the industry as you watch the numbers rise and you see the final sale prices, each watch unique, thus the nomenclature only watch. So obviously, you know, Patek Philippe, I could have guessed this a priori without seeing the outcome, but the Patek Philippe 5208 mono pusher chronograph perpetual calendar instantaneous jump minute repeater in titanium with a blue dial was the highest grossing watch, 6,200 Swiss francs. That's out of a total haul for the whole auction of, I should say, 6,200,000. Don't cut them short, it's a good cause. Out of 10,770,500, that was the benefit for the whole auction. Over 6 million of that was just this one watch. Now, it was not the most memorable watch of the auction though, because this is a variation on something that exists. Vladimir Putin allegedly had one, and Terry Stern certainly wears one, but the FP Journe Chronograph Mono Pusher Piece Unique was absolutely stunning. First, because it was beautiful. Take a multi-scale iridescent blue dial from the Chronomet Bleu, add a tantalum case now in 44 millimeters, a piece unique tantalum case, and then a caliber entirely in rose gold, split second, built just for this watch. F.P. Jorn said this is the only one he's gonna make like that. He's a man of his word and I believe him. And it became the highest grossing auction result ever for an independent brand watch sold at auction. At 1,150,000 Swiss franc, someone got something special. And I dare say at some point in the future, this watch will auction for more. This is a good investment, even at that price. I will say it was not, however, the only F.P. Jorn in the auction. The most underrated watch of the auction, the Barbier Muller Chronomet, based on the Chronomet Souverain caliber 1304, made by F.P. Journe, case movement and dial. It's actually a sort of marquetry of the semi-precious stone jasper featuring green, white, black, and red, all blended into a watch named after a philanthropic family, an old family of wealth and philanthropy in Geneva. Personal friends with F.P. Journe, it had a glorious hunter-style case back that's even more beautifully set with Jasper than the dial. And F.P. Journe actually told me and Josh in Geneva that this was the biggest pain in the butt dial his dial manufacturer ever created. And even if he wanted to make another, he wouldn't put up with it. So purchased at 90,000 Swiss francs. This was both the most underrated watch of only watch and probably the best bought. Again, I would not doubt that this will show up at auction for twice or thrice the money sometime in the future. But I hope whoever bought it, bought it to love it because it's lovable. The most beautiful, however, not most memorable, not most valuable, not most underrated, but most beautiful, was a watch that represent only a small variation from a series production item. You remember the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar, I believe it's the reference 26579 in this application with the blue dial. This is a watch that's basically the perpetual calendar ceramic that came out 
earlier this year, but with a blue dial. And somehow, Audemars Piguet made a small change and caught lightning in a bottle, or I should say, an octagonal ceramic case. With a bracelet that allegedly takes something like 30 hours to hand finish and a dial that's only ever going to be seen in this example, it pulled at someone's heartstrings sufficiently to coax 800,000 Swiss francs out of his pocket. And again, you can debate the money spent, but in my opinion, this is the most beautiful watch, the most sublimely gorgeous sold or auctioned at Only Watch this year. But the good news is, even if you aren't a pro baller, entertainer, or owner of some sort of Middle Eastern principality, the bottom line is that you can still win a watch at the Only Watch auction. And the proof of that was the Maurice Lacroix Akon Automatic Chronograph, my choice for best buy. For real world money, 5,500 Swiss francs, or roughly that in US dollars, someone got a piece unique a pretty good looking watch that does a reasonable approximation of an AP Bumblebee and a peerless backstory while spending the money on a good cause, this is the ultimate conversation starter at your next watch club meeting. The fact that a watch like this seems to go for under 10 grand every year at Only Watch means that there's still something for the people. Not necessarily all people, but people with $5,500 to spend on a watch. And again, peerless provenance, you're part of an elite club when you pick something up for Omega Money at Only Watch. Well bought, whoever that was. Okay, so from the feel-good stories of the year to the pain in my gut, pain in the butt, this is one that kind of makes me a bit morose because what it means, not for the top of the collector market, but for the mainstream collector bidding on run-of-the-mill vintage, it was, of course, Patek Philippe's, well, psych, Rolex Daytona, Paul Newman, 6239. You thought I was going to say Patek Philippe but this one actually broke Patek's record from less than a year ago for the most money ever spent on a wristwatch. My point, crazy things are happening at the top of the auction market, and it's no longer a matter of sense. The fact that we've now seen the record for the highest price ever paid for a wristwatch broken in the last year, the highest price ever paid for a Rolex broken a couple of times in the last year, the highest price ever paid for a Daytona, naturally by default broken, means we're in something of an asset bubble. Cheap money and central bank policy has finally found its way to the watch world, and here's the proof. Now, on October 26th, the unthinkable happened at Phillips's inaugural New York auction entitled Winning Icons, Legendary Watches of the 20th Century. Now, this is a watch that went out for $17,752,500, including the buyer's premium. We're at a point now where all of these records are falling, not just for Patek Philippe, not just for Rolex, and not just for Marquis Rolex, but I've seen just in the last eight months the record for a Giger Lecoultre deep sea diving alarm broken twice. The previous highest price ever paid for an Omega Speedmaster was virtually doubled in that period. This is not a good place to be, and I feel that at this point, the top of the market is limited to a couple of high-rolling speculators, fools, and perhaps the smallest contingent involved, committed and dedicated collectors. What bothers me is not how the foolish spend their money. I limit my impulse buys to $10 million or what I find in the supermarket checkout queue aisle, whichever is lower. That said, I hate to see the rank-and-file enthusiast priced out of the market for once accessible vintage pieces, when you earnestly love something because of its backstory and its charm, I hate to see you shouldered aside by speculators and foolish money. This bothers me a lot, and Phillips has already announced another Daytona auction for next May. And its agencies actually released this very modest promotional graphic in advance. Low key. The Daytona Ultimatum, humbly titled. All right. Here's the problem. The irony here is that if you read the auction announcement on Hodinkee, no, I, I said Hodinkee, the other Hodinkee. There you go. Okay. There was an overtone of disgust with this whole affair that as we don't need another overpriced vintage watch. We don't need another record setting Daytona sale. And this is the problem. It's ironic because Hodinkee bears more responsibility. Internet names, you never fail me. For the current state of the vintage watch market, from the entry level to the absolute top, they bore more responsibility than any other vendor, certainly, in the marketplace. And more than any other current dealer, Hodinkee has been driving rather than along for the ride as vintage watches, once reasonably priced, 
have moved out of the reach of average enthusiasts who are end users and again love them for the story, the charm, and the fraternity of the watch collecting hobby. So if you're wondering why that old Hoyer Octavia first execution, why that old JLC Geophysic 1958, why your Galay triple calendar 723 value chronograph is now priced beyond your reach, remember there is an old Hebrew proverb that goes something like this. If you create a golem, he will hold you hostage for far more money than that old watch in bad condition is actually worth. I swear, that's been around forever, old proverb. And topical. So the bottom line is, from the war of watches to the war of the worlds, we go to the world of SIHH versus Basel World. Here's how it goes. SIHH launched in 1991 as a small watch-only exhibition driven by what would eventually become the Richemont Group, then Von Dome. It primarily was a tobacco company at the time. Now it's mostly a watch vendor. But here's the thing. Basel was smaller this year. How much smaller? 13% fewer exhibitors, which in a Basel World scale comes out to something like 200. Fewer visitors, about 40,000 less out of about 150,000 who attended in 2016. And this year's show, 2018's, will be two days shorter. The old palace where you used to see the independent watch brands, that's already gone. Where? Well, SIHH surged from 16 exhibitors in 2016 to about 24 four in 2017, and it's going to be at least 34 in 2018. SIHH is riding a high. It's on the rise. It's just watches. It's not pieces of watches. It's not a whole lot of business to business stuff. It's not jewelry in any way, shape, or form. And that's even at the Von Cleef and Orpels exhibit. The bottom line is today, when you go to SIHH, you see brands like Audemars Piguet, Alain Guttenzona, Chagère Le Coult, Ulysse Norden, MBNF. You see Vacheron Con you see, this year, Elegant by F.P. Journe is listed on the SAHH website. Fernand Bertou, Christophe Claret. These are premier brands. These are companies you want to see. Romain Gautier, Erwerk. All the old independents that used to exhibit at Basel have finally jumped ship and thrown in with Richemont at SIHH. This is the show of the future, and this is the model of the future. Just watches, no BS, mostly for the media, truth be told, but they will have public days this year. And if you're going to book just one block of your calendar to go to SIHH or Basel, for the first time, I would actually recommend this year you go to SIHH. It's the show on the rise, and I think ultimately it's going to win the War of the Watch Worlds. So all of that said, I think it's been bad news for Basel for three years now, and here's the ultimate irony. The people who bought you the Titanic DNA watches, well, guess what? Romain Jerome, they've jumped ship to SIHH. Okay. Now, this was probably, alongside Only Watch, the no-nonsense feel-good story of the year, the Patek Philippe Grand Exhibition in New York City. At Cipriani, New York City, 10 days in July, I saw people coming off the streets in sandals and tank tops, sunburned from their time at the Jersey Shore in Manhattan and being welcomed with white glove service, courtesy, consideration, and exhaustive explanations of the 10 rooms on display. There was no pretense. No one was turned away. No noses were turned up. This was Patek Philippe as you imagine. All the grandeur, no attitude, and perhaps the most audience-friendly, public-friendly, and persuasive argument in favor of outsiders joining the watch collector fraternity and hobby. This is the opposite of the auction scene. This brought people in. This made believers of families and lifelong watch nerds of kids. I can tell you, I was there. It's literally everything you imagined. Watches in the historic collection dating back to 1530. You can see them all in the Patek Philippe Museum, of which about one quarter of the collection was brought over to New York City. Talk to watchmakers. You can do that too. Three stories built inside a building for over $10 million. Patek Philippe told me that they normally do a large exhibition every three years or so, and this one was modeled by an exhibition in Munich a few years back, but they only do a show on this scale in the United States once in a generation. 
If you want to relive it online, I encourage you to do so. But if you had a chance to go, it's a feeling that cannot be related, that cannot be explained. The only way you can capture it, and I know because six months later, I went to visit Patek Philippe in Geneva at their Ruderone boutique and their museum. What they claimed to have captured of the museum and that flagship boutique was actually tangible in New York and Geneva. I stood in both places. I felt the same feeling. That's how good the grand exhibition was. Google image search, YouTube videos, I don't care how you get it, relive this moment. It will stay with you forever. All right, so from the best event of the year to probably the best new watch of 2017 with the FP Journe Vagabondage 3. I should explain why I was in Geneva. I was actually touring FP Journe's dial manufacturer, their case maker, and their main factory, as well as meeting some of the folks there, including Mr. Journe himself. This was by far the coolest watch of this year. The first continuous jumping seconds wristwatch and a jump hour for good measure. It's the conclusion of a trilogy that started in 2005 originally with a handful of pieces made for the Antikorum anniversary. This is a watch that is the third of the tonneau-shaped trilogy and the most complicated, a world premiere by virtue of that jumping second. Here's what I like about it. It takes traditional watchmaking, hand finishing, and materials, rose gold, steel, rubies, platinum, leather, sapphire, all things that can be repaired in perpetuity by a, by a talented master watchmaker, and it incorporates them in a way that had never been done before. This is what I think the way forward for high horology should be. A watch priced accessibly, if unobtainable by virtue of its rarity, this is using old materials and old craft to create new things in the space, something we haven't seen, not use of machine-made parts or photo lithographic etching processes inherited from Silicon Valley, not smart watches, not machine-made components thrown together with a high price. This is truly high horology and it points the way forward. But if you didn't already get your name on the list, it doesn't point the way forward for you. An exclusive piece and likely to stay that way. This was my favorite watch of the year. And I think Josh would agree with me, it was the standout of 2017. All right, from the most impressive two versions of the most impressive watch of the year, possibly the most Bollywood and talked about watch of the year was the Zenith DeFi Lab. Now, this one threw us all for a loop because it took a technology that we'd only seen in prototype form from De Bethun, well, actually, I think they only got it to the theory stage with Resonique, and the Genocond regulator from Valche Manufacture, and all of a sudden, from a combination of LVMH's houses, Guy Simon at Tag Heuer, Hublot with the case material, and Zenith with the final execution, we finally got a harmonic oscillator made in entirely of silicon, powered entirely by a spring. So yes, this is traditional watchmaking in a form you have never seen before. And I have to say, mission accomplished. This was about as much exposure and publicity as you can get from 10 watches, which is all that will be built of this series. I do hear a production version is coming. That said, what is it? Well, it's basically the old idea behind the Bulova Accutron takes something with a natural frequency. Bulova used a servo motor and a tuning fork with a battery. Zenith is using a silicon oscillator powered by a modified traditional escapement. It actually looks like a pinwheel and a spring. So what Bulova achieved with a tuning fork and a battery, Zenith is sort of achieving with a spring and silicon. Now, this is an interesting concept. It's a standout, and I will say this, on one hand, Jean-Claude Viver got people talking about a brand that desperately needs word of mouth, has a grand history, and I believe a grand future, but they needed some sort of a spark, and I believe that is it. Also, because the DeFi Lab system does appear to be something that can be mass produced at a reasonable price, these are gonna get into the hands, not just of the guy who purchased the Exalted 10, but of real collectors who wanna buy sub $10,000 watches. That is what I hear. And it lessens Zenith's dependence on the aging El Primero chronograph caliber. It's good to do one thing and do it well. It's better to do many things well, and I think that this points the direction to that. It also gets Zenith back to its roots as a manufacturer. Before that, watershed in 1969, the El Primero, if Zenith was known for just two things, it was known for being a manufacturer and it was known for winning chronometry trials. Well, mission accomplished. This thing's supposed to achieve deviation of one third of one second per day. Very impressive with a mechanical movement. 
In terms of the manufacture, well, watch this space. Right now, this is a lot of adopted technology from outside of Zenith brought in from LVMH corporate. We'll see if they can bring this in-house and make it truly a Zenith watch. All that said, challenges do remain. Consistency. Can they maintain the buzz with rank and file models? When everyone has one, does it remain special? Other issues. Brand identity. The look of the watch is Hublot, as is the case material. We already know that TAG supplied the underlying resonator technology via Guy Simon. Is there a way via traditional watchmaking to bring this into the family, but also find perhaps a way to hand finish these silicon parts and this foam metal case? Is there a way that traditional brass and gold and steel and platinum and rubies and yes, Traditional lubrication oils can continue to exist in a lineup for old timers like me who like the belle horlogerie, the traditional way of doing things beautifully. I'm hoping so. I'm hoping Zenith finds that balance. If they do, they will be by far the standout, not so much of this year and maybe not of the next, but they could be the brand of the next decade if they find a way to strike the balance between today, tomorrow, and yesterday. All right. Riding a high from the Zenith DeFi Lab, we ride a high out of Switzerland on the back of strong export figures. This was one of the stories of the year because 2016 and 2015 were nightmares. I mean, apocalyptic. Worse than the recession of 2008 to 2010. People say that the dip of the Great Recession was a, a one-year thing for the Swiss watch industry. Terrible, but it ended. This drop just lingered forever, and it wasn't until February 2017, as you can see, that exports started to rise again following disastrous sales, inventory buybacks from the Far East, supply gluts, discounting, Swiss watch exports rallied, and new watch transaction prices started rising, which meant less discounting. And significantly, we're now seeing a continuous trend unbroken since February of this year. Good news? Oh yeah. On a winning streak since February, it continues to the present as just yesterday, the Federation Horlogère, effectively the trade industry that represents the Swiss watch makers and component manufacturers, announced that exports rose 6.3 in November. This is great news. Sustained and building momentum, steel led all percentage gainers, but significantly all three primary categories, steel, gold, precious metals, and steel were up. It's being driven by mainland China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, and a couple of mainstream traditional European watch markets like the UK, Italy, and Germany. All that's really left is a rally in the United States. Still 10% of Swiss watch exports, it's an important market. The reason that Patek exhibition was here is because by nationality, the US is still Patek's number one export market. This is an important rally for the Swiss industry at large. US collectors, Uncle Sam, and <laughs> should we say, the Helvetic orders want you. Finally, from rising tides lifting all boats to perhaps flying at altitude in the one best known for that analogy, Breitling. Smooth sailing or easy riding at 15,000 feet? I don't know, but the Breitling sail was one of the stories of the year. In late April, the tectonic plates of the industry shifted as Breitling SA, in the hands of the Snyder family since 1978, when it was purchased from the original Breitling family, shifted to the ownership of London-based private equity firm CVC Capital Partners, who purchased the company for just short of 900 million US dollars. Now, in July, the second shoe dropped as IWC longtime brand CEO Georges Kern moved from the Richemont company that he'd helmed for the better part of 15 years to Breitling, where he takes the role as equity partner, so partial owner, and CEO. All you need to do is look at the histories of CVC and Georges Kern to realize that they're angling for an IPO. And in 1996, Georges Kern was part of the group that took Tag Heuer, that name again, public in an initial public offering. Now, ultimately, it was purchased by LVMH. But that success, followed by his run of success building up Aviator's sports watch lines with IWC, made him the man for Breitling. Ambitious targets lie ahead. 
And in order for him to fully cash in on his status as a partial owner, things for market share, turnover, brand equity are all going to have to improve. There are going to have to be fewer model lines, fewer SKUs in the catalog. There are going to have to be watches that are sized for guys like me who don't have big wrists. And I think without creating the now somewhat trite vintage re-editions right and left, Breitling has to find an organic way of getting in touch with its real history without pandering and without, again, just issuing plagiarism of its heritage. Take inspiration, not the literal form. If you do that, I think this could give Zenith a run as one of the most promising companies in the Swiss industry of the next decade. I will say this, though. Georges, CVC, Breitling, Theodore Snyder, I know you're still in there somewhere. Please update these ads. The time has come. It's been a long time since Vinny Barbarino, folks. Move on. Okay, guys, continue to follow me over the weekend at Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. I'm active daily, and probably the easiest way to reach me in direct communication is to comment under one of the photos I post. I always respond to comments under the new photos that I post every day. So reach out to me. I'll reach out to you. I'll see you guys on the web. Until then, happy holidays. Be well. And this week in watches will return for New Year's with Tim and Josh. I'll see you next time.